Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Institute for Government event on how the government can deliver its priorities while also preparing for future shocks. It's great to see a full room here at the IFG, and thanks to everyone who's also joining us online. We'll be live tweeting the event today, so do join in with that. Our, uh, our hashtag is IFG Crises. Seems rather negative. Um, <laughs> I don't know who came up with that one. Um, uh, if you're joining online, you can send in questions that we, uh, can t I can take via the iPad. Uh, so uh, use Slido for that. There should be a panel next to your screen, so you can send in your questions, and you can start sending them in as soon as you like. Uh, just to say, this is a slightly unusually short event for us, only 45 minutes, so we'll ask anyone who is asking questions at the end to be concise. Um, so, uh, as I say, welcome to this event. I'm really delighted that we have Meg Hillier, Chair of the Public Accounts Committee, here today. Of course, Meg has just uh, published today her seventh, I believe, annual report as Chair of the Committee, um, looking at the challenges and opportunities that the PAC uh, has observed in its work across Whitehall. And I'm equally delighted that we're also joined by Alex Chisholm, the Chief Operating Officer of the uh, Civil Service and Perm Sec in the Cabinet Office, um, who's here to talk about lots of the issues that uh, Meg has raised in her report. Um, so let's start with you, Meg. Um, you highlight in your report um, some repeated problems which you say the committee has seen uh, in Whitehall. And I think that this is to me, seems the tremendous value of having a report like this is that you can look across the piece. Obviously, the PSC is a very busy committee, um, gets lots of specific reports looking at different aspects of how government is working. Uh, but you've tried to pull out some of the themes you've seen. So what do you think are the most important things that we should take from your report? Well, I think in a, you, inevitably over the last year or so, we've seen very fast changeover in government. And one of the th so one of the things is that we don't, we sometimes in the moment so much that we get the bigger picture. And some of that bigger picture stuff is around skills and capability, which has improved in the 12 years I've been on the committee. And we have more specialists in digital procurement and so on, but still there is still a tendency for the fast stream to have generalists who are very bright, but not necessarily capable of delivering some of the more technical aspects of government. There is a tendency in that speed of, of action not to think about the long term. I think good politics, um, so for politicians and civil servants, need to be looking, you know, as well as what's the crisis today, tomorrow, and what might be happening next week, we need to be looking at 10 and 20 year horizons. And with digital change, very often we are looking at 20 year horizons. We also get very bound up in not failing fast. So, on the contrary, while we need to do look at the long term, if things aren't working, we need to say, let government say it's not working and pull out quickly and, and properly. And we see, sometimes see, uh, for instance, the Emergency Services Network, that's a program that hasn't really delivered. We've looked at that about 15 times now. Um, and w there haven't been proper lessons learned on a lot of that. And then the key thing that I pull out is about understanding risk. And obviously, COVID, as we've played that out, has played into that. And um, we've called um, for a risk, uh, senior risk officer in government to look overall at risk across government, like you have in banking. So a bank could not keep its license if the risk manager and risk officer said uh, that we can't do this, they have to abide by their advice. We don't have the same equivalent in government. And the danger is, we believe on the committee, and, and I believe, is that if you don't have something like that mechanism, you can have the day-to-day -day politics or the day-to-day -day pressures for civil servants of, of government take over from looking at those longer-term risks. So that's something we have perhaps a slight disagreement with the, the civil service on that. I don't want to put words into Alex's mouth. <laughs> Well, let's give Alex an opportunity to respond on that and, and more generally. So I think for me what really comes out of the report is this. It's, it's a picture of, of a year in which government has been emerging from the pandemic, and emerging from a, a context in which government's had to respond very quickly to a sort of crisis situation, um, has had to roll out enormous programmes, um, you know, do very rapid procurement, all these sorts of unusual activities, while also maintaining business as usual. And I, and I guess that is, I mean, just to pick up on that last point that Meg was making, they're very much, that is therefore very much a, a risk uh, balancing task for the senior leadership of the civil service. Yes, indeed. And, and great to see you here this morning and uh, or this afternoon now. And, you know, uh, first of all, I, uh, you know, I really agree with um, what this report says. And in fact, what you say every time I appear in front of you, really, which is that these longer term issues are very important really, to pay attention to them. And we mustn't just be distracted by the new new thing, the immediate pressure. 
um, as well as the acute, as the chronic, and we need to make sure that um, in our response to hashtag crisis, we are getting stronger and wiser and better in consequence. And I, you know, I believe we are. And um, you know, those of us who've been through the uh, aftermath of the financial crisis, getting ready for Brexit, dealing with COVID, um, consequence of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You know, it's been, it, it has felt like one thing after another, but I do think we have got a lot more capable as a consequence, much more focused on, um, on delivery, much, much better understanding about what it takes to do that successfully, both in relation to digital systems and the needs of end users, more coordinated across the system with different elements of government, which is really important. Um, uh, and much better, I think, at, at those key things you highlighted around digital change, evaluation, and risk management, um, which, is, which is really common, I would say, between us in a way. Um, the, the questions you ask of me are very often, I find the questions I ask of the rest of the sisters about how are we trying to get better in this way and pushing for the same things. Um, you did highlight one area where we do have disagreement. So since this can't be too consensual because that wouldn't be entertaining enough for the <laughs> audience who have given up their lunch break. So that is true that on the issue um, of risk management, we are really keen to see an improvement in the risk management. And we've invested a lot of effort in that, both in the structures of um, risk management. We have our new uh, head of risk indeed reporting into the, uh, the treasury um, and a lot of pro uh, professional skills and process and attention to that. The one thing that we haven't said we agree with is to have a person who is the, the chief risk officer. And the reason for that is really twofold. One is, um, and you remember Chris Wellwald and I were sort of arguing with, with you before at a PAC hearing, we both felt, and I think it's a common view across the system, that um, you know, permanent secretaries, CFOs, DGs, SROs, the major programs, they need to be responsible for managing the risk. And if there's someone called the chief risk officer, the risk is everyone else there, the risk that somebody else is concerned, and that would be dangerous. So we, don't, we, want, to, we want to keep the responsibility um, and to be accountable for that. And also because government is so broad that there is, it's not like a bank, there isn't a single person who could have any chance of trying to get their arms around the particular risk because we've got so many, the risks that arise in relation to national security or public health are very different to the risks um, on an economic side or in relation to social policy. So um, we, we say having a chief risk officer would make things worse rather than better, but having more attention to risk is you know, absolutely common ground. Well, where I disagree with you on that is that it doesn't, having a chief risk officer wouldn't stop all of those other people taking notice mm. of risk. It would be very worrying if it did. And as an accounting mm. officer, actually, yeah. you couldn't not to take account of that risk. Yeah. But it's about having that overview. And that's helpful at a political level. Imagine you know, a new government comes in, mm -hmm. they need to see what the problems are. And in the day-to-day -day distractions that absorb number 10, the mm -hmm. cabinet office, as well as the longer term planning, that I think is important to have. Yeah. And actually, if you look at it in other settings, it works and it does deliver. And I think the danger is, um, and you know, if I've been provocative, that you all defend your silos a bit and you want to be in charge of your own departments, but mm -hmm. actually there isn't that overarching view across government. You in the cabinet office are the nearest that it gets to that. Yeah. But that can depend on a number, not on sometimes on the personalities involved, both political and at senior civil service level. And, and it needs to be, I think, stronger than that. Yeah, so um, having moved from a de departmental position to uh, when I, I used to run Bayes, uh, the Business Energy Industrial Strategy Department, to the centre, of course, I'm very much in favour of a strong centre now. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and working together with Treasury in kind of lockstep, mm. um, applying that proper pressure for continuous improvement and including in relation to risk management. And that very much is a joint undertaking between Cabinet Office and Treasury. And a lot of the things that we do, as you, you know, when you've had hearings on things like, uh, you know, fraud or digital service and things you often get, or property, you often get Cabinet Office and Treasury to say, what are you doing across government mm -hmm. to improve the overall system here? And that, you know, we rightly accept that responsibility. And that is indeed one of the advantages of those of you who've been at this a long time. The Cabinet Office used not to do all of this work. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the Cabinet Office of old was kind of doing that traditional world of coordination, supporting the Prime Minister, interface of Parliament, etc. But it didn't really do the business of a corporate HQ of all this cross-cutting functional professional work, but that's what we do now. Yeah, and how many, you've got a very high number and of yeah, staff. And yes, so as a result of you know, mm. 10,000 people working mm. in the cabinet, I say, well, surely it doesn't require all those people to do traditional cabinet. No, it doesn't. I mean, those people are, many of them are working in other departments as commercial procurement experts. All the fast streams in government are now on our books, you know, so there's a certain number of people who 
actually don't work in the cabinet office but come under the cabinet office. But the main area is that we've got a lot of people working now in, in digital services, in HR, in security, in property, in counter fraud, the public sector fraud authority, a new body which we just set up in last year. All of these people are really super trained, super expert. They're not those kind of uh, old amateurs who you, 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 you used to worry about. And they're also people who are very focused on the outcomes that you can achieve and prepared to see things through, which again is a very important theme in your report. Just pushing on from that, the, yeah. the other theme that relates to that, which, which uh, comes out in Meg's report, is about government's ability to attract the really high quality people with those skills yeah. uh, into those professions, which is, yeah. you say, sitting um, sort of notionally in the cabinet office, yeah. but actually um, in some ways dispersed across the system. Do you feel that you actually have the right pay and uh, sort of systems, ways to attract people in to do those jobs that you need? Because of the flexibilities, are, you know, I hear from lots of people in the civil service can be quite a constraint. Yeah, it's tough. And I think you rightly yeah, um, uh, highlight the point that we need to focus on the most. So we're never going to be able to match the salaries that the top digital people, top property people, the top security people can get in the private sector. Um, you know, and I do a lot of direct recruitment. I have all the heads of functions all report to me. And by definition, those people often, you know, open competitions, they come from the private sector. And some of them get paid millions. I mean, literally millions every year. So we're not going to, there's no, it's inconceivable for me that a future government would say that was the right thing to do. So what we can do is we can pay, you know, a reasonable amount to, to offset, if you like, the gap. But more importantly, as you say, is making sure that those people really have the ability to be effective in their roles, really have the support. Um, obviously, people are very motivated to come into public service. They all find the work we do is so satisfying and so interesting. But if they can't get what they want done, that, that, that is the thing that yep. would put people off. Well, it's interesting as well. When we were looking at this recently, we saw that the number of apprenticeships in digital had gone down. Yep. That was actually a perverse outcome of the headcount reduction announcement. So that's a sign that politicians should be careful what they ask for, because actually one of the other things is the civil service could be growing its own, because if you get someone in young and train them up, yep. then they are going to be embedded hopefully for longer because of the pensions and so on that will, will drive people through. And actually the civil service is a big enough machine mm -hmm. to do that yep. um, and, and create its own. And so we think there needs to be something more creative on that. So, but we're very worried on the committee. <clears throat> We've looked at digital transformation across a number of departments now, and they are very long-term programmes. Very often um, they're seen as an IT, or they were uh, until more recently, seen as an IT program. And actually it's a business transformation program that has huge potential to save billions of pounds of taxpayers' money and make life more efficient for us all as well. Um, so we're saving, saving time for the businesses and so on. That complete, I mean, DEFRA has got a very hard hand to, uh, to deal with. So feel sorry for Tamara Finkelstein because they've got some of the most aging, difficult um, mm -hmm. uh, digital databases. One case, in, in one case, vets were having to go on eBay to buy old technology because the platform that was being used was so out of date it wouldn't work on new technology. That's the kind of reality of what's going on. When we looked at, at driving licenses because of the challenges, uh, that were, the slight delays for some of those in lockdown, while bits of the system are efficient if you've got a straightforward driving license renewal, a woe betide you if you're older or you've got a health problem and you have to go through a very paper-based mm. process to deal with that. And so there are huge bits of the system that are really, really inefficient. And some of that is about having very high-level digital specialists, but actually a lot of it is making sure that everybody in the civil service is a digital specialist in a way. Yes, and I, I mean, I, you know, I really want to, put to, to uh, uh, pay, pay tribute to the work of the NAO and the PAC in this area. I think you've written some really brilliant reports. And I know it's been part of your, your intention, the CNAGs, to do more reports which can be uh, acted on with, with, with um, lessons learned and, and, and not just sort of, you know, as it were, looking for recriminations over the past. And your digital reports have been prime examples of that. We have agreed with those and adopted them. And I think you were kind enough to say that our plan, Transforming for a Digital Future, last year is a very good plan, embodies the lessons from the past, and we're actually on track with it. And your concerns now are, will we be, you know, stay on track for the next two years, which obviously is very important. But for the first time we have now, actually taken all of those legacy systems, which are so important, um, uh, in, uh, and really can constrain people from doing the job they want to do, which is provide great services to the public. And we've sort of put all of them into a stack, and all of the most serious ones are being remediated. And we have funded plans against that and timescales, and we're reporting to you every year on that. And you can see that some of those old systems have already been retired. And I think the, uh, it, you know, one of the side effects of COVID, a good one, is that I think the extent to which old systems hold you back 
has become really apparent to people and there has been a terrific investment, um, you know, two and a half billion pounds set aside in SR21 for overcoming these legacy problems. And on the back of new modern cloud-based systems, it's much easier to provide the super fast, super high quality, low error rate digital services that everyone expects. Um, and some of our best services today, like universal credit, again, fire tested during COVID, I think they had 150,000 applications one evening, um, were able to cope both with the volume, but also with people not being able to get into job centers and people being able to get access, not only to money, but also to advice and support through their own personal journal, um, which is part of the, the, the system they have there. So I think lots of investments that have been made by DWP and HMRC, particularly over the years, but other departments too, have made us much more agile, much better, you know, able to cope with, uh, with challenges and also more focused on giving fantastic services. But one of the challenges, of course, is endlessly, I mean, if I had a, a pound for every time you mentioned it, data, 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 the data that government collects is often very poor, um, is often very, not even in the past, it wasn't even really understood why your data was important. I think we're certainly yeah. seeing through the committee now with different witnesses, there's a bit better understanding of that. Mm -hmm. It feels like it slows things down and you can't have the digital without the data improvement. You've got to both go hand in hand, otherwise you're just sticking a new computer and digital system on top of existing poor setups. So that's something that really needs to improve. And the other thing that's always at risk of this is the high turnover of both officials, particularly SROs, and ministers. Obviously, we've seen a particularly high turnover of ministers in the last year. But actually, you know, and when Tony Blair was prime minister, there was quite a fast turnover of ministers. David Cameron kept people in post a bit longer, sort of, you know, so they were at least accountable for their decisions. Yeah. There, were, there were probably there were arguments both ways, but failure is always an orphan. And the danger is that the person, whether it's the politician or the minister that births the project, isn't there at the next stage and there certainly isn't there at the failure point. And so, in fact, once, uh, in fact, uh, sadly, it was the day that PC Palmer was murdered in Parliament, but Alex was one of three witnesses from then DEC. Uh, so the, there was the, the current and two former permanent secretaries of, the, of, of then DEC were going to appear in front of us because we needed to see a project. We were discussing a project that went from beginning to end and mm. it didn't happen, but that was an example of, very rare example, where we would have had three people in the room from the birth of a project to the end of a project. So no one could say, well, it was before my time. Yeah. And it is hard. I mean, I don't, not crying civil servants who try to read into the old papers, but it's never the same reading into the papers. Well, you tell me, but going yeah. back and reading the papers is a very yeah. different thing to actually having lived through it. Um, so I think that there is a big, a big issue there about, about data and about turnover. I want to come back to the turnover <coughs> question, but I'll let you just, I mean, I think. Well, just, I, yeah. I really, really agree with that. And we have been doing a few things to try and strengthen the incentives for people to stay in position because, mm -hmm. Um, particularly on those major programs. You know, the um, universal credit is an example, smart meters another, where you've had somebody who's seen it through all those vicissitudes and learned a lot. Well, Neil Cooley still... was in front of us yesterday, exactly, yeah. 10 years yeah. now dealing with it. And, 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 and Darren Walker mm -hmm. smart meters the same. So I think that is exemplary, and we've tried to make that more the norm. So um, let's try and encourage that. We've, but they don't get know, promotion. That's the problem. We, we have been doing pivotal mm -hmm. role allowances, which, is, which has really helped there. Um, they also get amazing training, um, and I think three quarters of the people who run major programs now have been for the MPLA or, uh, you know, um, uh, or are on it now. Um, and uh, it, it has begun to make an effect. I was looking at the, how the average tenure for an SRO of a major program was three and a half years, is now four and a half years. So it has begun to move in the right direction. Maybe it needs to be longer, but that's, that's good. Um, the other thing is just more generally, not just the major programs, there is a, a tendency for people to bounce around between roles and play a kind of a bingo between kind of little arbitrage opportunities. That's not great for the system. Mm. Um, so we're trying to, one of the reasons that we've been developing proposals for capability-based pay is it tries to recognize people for domain knowledge mm. and for skills that are relevant to their current job so that it, you know, if you want to improve your pay, a very natural human desire, you don't have to get promoted or moved to another department to do that. Mm. Can I go back to the point about uh, long-term focus that so we talked yeah. about it in, rela in relation to, to yeah. digital, in relation to, to uh, major projects and mm -hmm. so on? Obviously, political churn as mm -hmm. well as civil service churn can create issues with ke keeping a long-term focus on some of these projects and, and, and areas where you, you know, mm -hmm. at the centre, are trying you know, in your sort of corporate role mm -hmm. to keep a focus. How can the civil service um, ensure that sort of investment is sustained on programmes, particularly in the current climate, yeah. um, when there's political churn going on around you? 
Yeah, so I think I mean, it's a great question. Um, I think some of the ways that we've just been talking about in relation to things like legacy systems by saying this is a, a funded program where it's publicly accountable and you know, rightly I welcome the attention of the NAOPSA sort of tell me where you are every year with that, tell me about your progress. That's a way of making sure that something that is important but not always urgent uh, is attended to. The focus on risk is very good. So who, who has set, you know, who set that risk appetite? Who really owns that? Who's going to be accountable for it? We try and make it harder for people to evade that responsibility to pin it on people because you then feel, I am the risk owner. I am now going to drive you know, the, the investment in that and see it through to make sure that they very, very important long-term things, even high impact, low prob probability events do get the attention that they need. So that's part of the process. I also think that, um, again, institutions, not just because you're here today, but you know, the PAC and the IFG have a good part to play in that because you're not in the day-to-day -day in the same way. And you're there to say, look, what is the pattern? What is the learning? And to make sure that we're not recreating errors. But there's a challenge, of course, with politicians. So I think, as I'm the politician on the platform, I should probably address that head on. And we know that, I mean, you know, there, there are, we've all seen it, ministers who won't will perhaps put off a decision because they think they might get reshuffled before mm. they have to take responsibility or ownership yeah. for an issue. And so there is a challenge to be done with the political class to make sure that we are looking at that long term too. And actually, we're at a very dangerous point now. I'm going to see David here that, that, and Toby that moment when we're writing manifestos. So somebody in each of the main parties is right, sat away in a room beavering away at this, probably not talking to any of us about it. Mm. Um, and the danger is that things get written down that become a promise and a proposal that actually aren't achievable. Or we'll say, we'll, you know, the Labour Party will say, we're going to have X number of new doctors. And the Conservative Party will say, well, we better up it a bit. And then mm. becomes this sort of auction going on that isn't always deliverable. Yeah. So, so there is a challenge and it's one of my bugbears, which I think beyond my reach on the PAC is how you get manifesto writing embedded in reality. Um, it would be a good help to the civil service. But then, the, then the, the, the challenge is about how the civil service manages to keep the things that need to be going. Well, there's a spitball of politics going on up here, yeah. whether good or bad or an election. I mean, not all bad stuff, it's you know, democracy, but the, the, the basic stuff that, that still has to happen. And there's nothing to stop a minister coming in and saying, yeah. I give you a direction um, yeah. to scrap that digital programme because I want the money sped, spent somewhere else instead. And that's that's always a, a risk. So we've got to make sure, um, actually through the good offices of the IFG party, that we're making mm -hmm. sure that all potential ministers are trained. I have been to the Major Projects Leadership Academy, and I think David will have probably gone to that mm -hmm. as well. And um, I don't know if to, probably Toby hasn't, because we wouldn't have, uh, uh, we haven't been in government <laughs> uh, in that time. But it's, it's, it is, it's something that I now know ministers go through. Um, but the thing is, anybody could become a minister, as we saw with the coalition. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we're a bunch of rank amateurs MPs, really, on the whole. So we, we come in, and we don't know what we're doing until we're doing it. Um, and we rely on the civil service and others mm -hmm. to give advice. And so there is it's an inherent tension, uh, good and bad, in the system. Um, not all bad, because sometimes policies of previous governments do need to be changed because it's a political change or because mm. they weren't working. But that is, is, is a risk, I think. And I think this turnover issue is something that really bothers us. So that we have seen that improvement in SROs, but we still think there isn't enough reward. And how many people who really run projects have become uh, permanent secretaries? You're probably the most project hands-on um, secretary nearly in the system. I think I'm thinking of trying thinking running my. I'd say probably you can't <laughs> not allowed to say, but <laughs> but because you were at the CMA and other and you've had private sector experience, but actually there are not a lot of public of civil permanent secretaries who've gone through that route of delivering a major project. Uh, David Williams, I suppose, would be one of the nearest and yeah. one of the ones at Defence, yeah. but there aren't yeah. many of you who've gone through that route. Now, not under crying that your political skills mm -hmm. are pretty important, especially in recent times, yeah. um, but. But delivering a major project for us on the committee is understandably pretty high priority. Yeah. Uh, to focus on something more positive, um, in a way, the uh, pandemic generated a great deal of innovation, particularly in public services, in the NHS, yeah. for example, virtual wards, that sort of thing. How are you going about, Alex, trying to sort of foster and sustain that uh, spirit of innovation and sort of... Uh, back to risk, but, you know, justifiable risk-taking, failing mm -hmm. fast is sort of thing that you highlight in your report in the civil service coming out of the pandemic. Yeah, and no, I, I, I really welcome the PAC's attention on this, and it's, it's in your, 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 your remarks in, as chair, Meg, um, because I think that is an area we need to, to do more at, you know, frankly. I think the civil service is very good at kind of inspired improvisation. It's amazing, actually, <laughs> what people are able to do in response to... Um, uh, the demands of the situation, the political masters. But um, what we're not so good at, I think, is at, at um, uh, being systematically trialling new things 
uh, and choosing from that which is the best and sticking with that. Um, and I think again, you know, right in your report, you highlight that we continue with kind of low value projects uh, for too long. It's not that they have no value, but they're just not as good as other ones we could be doing. And that therefore creates a terrific drag effect on the overall system because there's obviously a limited amount of resources, both human and financial. And we do need to get better at saying, it's fine your project, you know, it not, it's not personal, you've done everything possible, but we have to stop that project now because there's one more valuable that's coming on and we need you to work on that. And I don't think we are as good at that as, as we could be. And obviously our political system and our, you know, the, the, the way the kind of the media inquiry works sometimes I think provides uh, negative incentives again for politicians to say, I'm, I'm stopping this. Um, uh, and we just need to be possibly a little bit more mature at recognizing that you can't do everything brilliantly. And maybe some of that will come out through the, the thinking and the inquiry about, about COVID will we'll say, look, you know, in a tough world, you, you won't get everything right. Um, and, but you, you need to learn fast. How, yeah. how does PAC think about this? Because obviously, you know, you spend a lot of your time asking people about things that have gone wrong. Mm. Yeah. How do you think about how to do that in a way which doesn't make them think, well, next time, I don't want such a tough appearance before the PAC, I won't mm. Yeah, well, won't there, are, there are some slam dunk. I mean, in fact, when I remember Philip Hammond, when he was Chancellor, he said mm. some of these things I sign off, I know they're going to be in front of the PAC in a few years' time. Yeah. So we know that some that are problematic at birth, yeah. which, which everyone's trying to yeah, resolve yeah. with better contracting and so on, and some that become more problematic. So some that are sort of slam dunk just is failed. I mean, um, the, the, the airport in St. Helena, where it was so windy you couldn't land aircraft, uh, and they actually discussed lopping the top off a mountain to make it better, I kid you not. I mean, you know, there's some of these you just actually can't believe. That was a training session in the Commonwealth for a while, so they, yeah, I think yeah. it embarrassed the UK so much. The Kenyans came up with one about prisoner effluence fueling their kitchens, which was a failure. But that's why, so there are failures around the world. But then, but actually, it is partly that, it is really important we, we pull out from those day-to-day -day issues and pull out some of these wider themes, because one thing, we're a cross-party in the PAC, let's not forget, four parties mm -hmm. represented. We have a very strong ethos that we've got a constitutional role to help mm -hmm. government improve because mm -hmm. every pound of our constituents' money in spent in taxes is a pound we want to see spent well. We're helped by the fact we're not saying whether the government policy X is the right policy, but did X get delivered as X was supposed to be delivered is really where we're at. And that's uh, and where we see repeated failures, uh, you know, um, the committee agreed my report without it, it, it's, it's something as a take it or leave it report but they they agreed it because we all do have share the same broad views on this yeah. and i think that we've got to make sure that we look at that long term that we are helping civil servants admit mistakes we had a very good session yesterday actually about resetting programs which is some of you here might be interested generally not something you put in a political leaflet you know yeah. standing for election to get reset program programs <laughs> reset better but it, it was interesting having four SROs talk very openly and honestly about what had gone wrong and what had gone right, including we pushed them on what ministerial intervention worked and what didn't. Mm -hmm. So they were giving shout outs to some ministers where that back, that strong backup ability, yeah. ability to say, this isn't working, we are going to stop it. And we need yeah. to allow people in the political and civil service sphere to say that, that this isn't working, we have called on it and yeah. not keep it limping on so that the next person calls on it and it's not on your record as a failure. Actually, if you get 90% of things right 90% of the time, you're doing pretty damn well, but you've got to call out the 10% that's not going well. And, and I'm a Shoreditch MP, so I would say a bit more Shoreditch, a little less Whitehall sometimes, <laughs> um, which might terrify Alex. No, no, <laughs> that's good, that's good. Although I, I haven't got my, my own soundbite ready for that one, but, the, uh, <laughs> um, but just a, a, a few things to add about that. I suppose one of the financial incentives the, um, uh, the Treasury came up with the Shared Outcomes Fund, and that has been really good over the years, actually encouraging. Um, and it, it is competitive, different departments, different parts of government come up with the proposals and the best get backed, and they are, as the name suggests, they require working across government, which is the space that you recognise. Not enough of those, though. Important. We haven't seen that many joint bids, really. Yeah, but more, yeah, and there's another round just, just happening now. The data challenge is another thing that we've done to try and encourage this. I think through COVID, we've got much better work in scientific community, which is where obviously a lot of innovation is going to come from. Um, we, uh, people's skills and understanding of the opportunities of innovation have been, we've got a, a data innovation masterclass over 5,000 people have done. And I suppose the other thing I think is incredibly important from my experience in the private sector is that, you know, it, it's a, it is a kind of a truism that it's the customer that keeps you honest where that's where you have to keep innovating in order to keep up with the customer's expectations. We have become much more like that in government in our top 75 government services program, move, trying to move you know, 50 of those to the great standard we say all of those services, that's the ones which have the highest level of transactions and use across all of public service, that's 75 out of about 7,500, 7, so it's the top 1%, the 80% by volume of use. 
we say all those need to have a single service owner. And then if you are the single service owner, you are saying, like, what do we do, need to do, to, you know, in the next week, the next month, the next year to improve that service to customers? And that will drive that continuous innovation culture is what we want to But, I mean, on data, it's well, there were still really big gaps. So when yep. we were quizzing DWP about some of the data, they weren't mm. even collecting the, ethnic, the statistics on ethnicity mm. of claimants in some sectors. And they were just beginning to do that. We were, mm. we were in 20, this was last year, I think 2022, just beginning to do that. Mm. And this is absolutely critical. And if you're a minister, I remember when I was a minister many, many years ago, a long time ago since we were in government, um, and there was a cut a budget cut mm. being proposed. In the Home Office, they were talking about cutting the social, social science budget. And I said, and I was the science minister in the Home Office, I said, don't do that, because then there will be a gap in understanding. And any future ministers of whatever party will not have an understanding of the wrong, long running thing. I think it in the end did get cut. My voice was a, a lone and small voice in the corner of the Home Office that most people didn't notice or care about. But um, I don't say that bitterly. I think that's just realistic about politics. Um, but that is a tragedy. And that is another bit that's difficult. Does the civil service try and protect that? Mm. But if a new minister comes in and says, well, that bit of money over here could be better spent somewhere else, that is a democratic uh, decision. And it is a really, it, it's a challenge. But the data, sometimes the bleeding, the obvious data is still not collected. And something that we would want to see, not just because we're on the committee, but actually you take your average MP, they want to know these sort of facts and figures. They might not all frame it in that way, but that's what we need to know. And I think that is still a shock to me that the system hasn't quite caught up with the modern modern world. And that was some, yeah. certainly something the IFG found in a recent report we did on the Treasury, mm -hmm. and the response that the Treasury had to COVID was that some of the sort of amazingly fast, uh, huge programmes that were rolled mm -hmm. out in terms of support to people could have been better targeted if there'd been more preparatory yeah. work, yes, if the absolutely. data We've had been that. there yeah. to understand yeah. mm -hmm. um, how, to, how to target that support yeah. better. One final question uh, to you both, and then we're going to come to uh, questions from the floor and online. Um, Permsex tell me they fear appearing before the PAC much more than they do their own departmental select committees. Um, so I'm interested, Meg, if you think there's anything other committees should learn from the PAC. And uh, Alex, I'm interested in your comment on mm. uh, what Meg says in her report about uh, the fact that she feels civil services under scrutinised by Parliament. I wonder what your view is on that. Um, well, I think it's interesting because now we have a thing called guesting. So for those who are not nerdily following how select committees work, any member of any select committee in the House of Commons is allowed to, by request or by invite, guest on another committee. So I've guested on other committees. We've had members from those committees guest on us. And we found that a really fruitful environment. But what's been interesting, so I went to one committee and um, I was absolutely shocked that the witnesses were saying, I don't have those numbers to hand. I don't know that. I can't tell you that figure. They would never have got away with that in front of the Public Accounts Committee. And we do take it very seriously as a committee. We prepare as a team at least a week out. You know, we, As a team, we all get together a week before people are maybe prepared before then so that we are all, all really trying to pull together on the same page and make sure that we're on top of the facts, figures and data and information and then really take it above that so we don't expect... We expect our witnesses to know their stuff. We expect that we are on top of it enough to make sure that we don't have to get mm. into the weeds and that we can try and raise it above. So I think pr it's, it's, it, preparation uh, is, for us, a big part of it. But, but I think it is an expectation that, well, certainly I've fostered, but I think it was fostered well before me as a 160-year-old expectation that you wouldn't come in front of the Public Accounts Committee and not know your onions because you wouldn't get away with it. Is that how you feel? Uh, it is how I feel. Um, <laughs> Good. Uh, <coughs> And I think very rightly, and I think the um, uh, two, two, two sort of um, differences between select committees and the PAC, I think, um, uh, which is striking to me as a civil servant. So one is that uh, as an accounting officer, you are personally responsible yeah. to Parliament. So that feels a bit different to attending a select committee, especially if you're alongside a minister. Um, your, your personal accountability uh, you know, is, is there, and that I'm, I'm sure you feel it both when you give evidence and you prepare for it, and also when you get back to the office afterwards and say, I never, never want to have to go through that again, thank you very much, so let's fix this problem. So it has a, you know, has a strong salutary effect. Um, I think the other um, aspect, obviously, is that the, um, the PAC's hearings are almost without question after an, an NAO report and that the facts yes, of the NAO exactly, report yeah. are agreed uh, with the department. So I think that gives us a common information base and then you can have a good old argument yeah. about what, how to interpret that. But otherwise, the select committee often don't have that hard information base, so I think they, they miss that. And I do notice that you do work as a team, um, in the, you know, as, as, as a PAC, and also that um, you are very thoughtful about the effect you have on the system over time, and that helps, obviously, longevity is a benefit there. Um, and, you know, you've been calling, for example, for more evaluation. I think you wrote a critical report about three years ago. 
you know, is in the Declaration of Government Reform. We put a huge effort into, a, into that. The Evaluation Task Force is mm -hmm. part of my department now, you know, co-supported by the Treasury. I think they've now evaluated 211 programmes over £100 billion. Pounds. I mean, we might have done that without your stimulus, but we might not. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said you should be doing that, do it properly. And we said, fair enough, we'll do it. And hopefully we give you the, yeah. we occasionally give you the plaudits when you do things <laughs> that we've asked for. Yeah. To, more, to more, pour on courage. More of those yeah. would always be welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Good try. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take some questions now. Uh, there's a waving mic from my colleague at the back. Um, and uh, if there's anyone next door who wants to come through and ask a question, please uh, feel free. So, uh, Lauren, the gentleman right next to you. Thank you. Roger Wicks from the British Red Cross. One of the key lessons we've learned from COVID was that what, what makes different groups vulnerable wasn't well considered in the UK response. How can we better consider and plan for the needs of vulnerable groups in future crises? Thank you. I guess we're going to do groups of three. So there's one at the front here, Lauren, and then I'll take one from online. And David Eddington, trustee of the IFG and um, recovering um, minister and uh, MP. Um, money. Um, the allocation of money is clearly key both to getting a major priority project right and to dealing with a crisis and having a contingency available. Um, does the bilateral process for negotiating this between Treasury and a spending department provide an adequate way of doing this when there's no cabinet discussion about the relative importance of different priorities and of the relative sums of money that should be allocated to each of them? Actually, those are two such good questions. I think we'll just start with those. Make your start. Okay, um, I think on the vulnerable groups thing, it's about data, data, data. Partly understanding who. who I mean, well, so first of all, it's about preparation for the, for, the, for a pan, the pandemic or any other critical situation. Because if well, I remember years ago being on a cabinet subcommittee talking about the then threatened pandemic, and I was a substitute for somebody for some reason, and and they talked about well, if there's a pandemic, we'll close schools. And I said, well, that'll be a problem, won't it? Because parents will want to work, so they'll all just bring the. You know, anyway, I asked that stupid question, if you like. Uh, only to find late, years later that actually that stupid question hadn't perhaps been asked enough in government. No one had thought of what would happen with schools closing. Um, so I was, you know, I'm not claiming anything particularly great there, but, but I, it, we need to be making sure we're preparing. Then the data so that you could easily access it. So the vulnerable people database was quite patchy actually in places, but it was cobbled together as well as it probably could be with us in the circumstances. Um, and then, then, when, then when you've got that data, how, how you access it, what databases you use, so some bits of the system work better than others, and then making sure, of course, all of that fits in with the planning. Do you want me to take both at the same time? So on the money, I, I think actually it is, it's a healthy tension to have a treasury that does what it does, but I think actually there's not enough political understanding. And the constant problem we have as members of the committee is you talk about billions and millions, and then you talk about £40,000 spent in someone's town centre, and they're far more interested in the £40,000 spent in their town centre than they are in the amount of money they can't even understand. And uh, it is a real frustration. And actually, it is a really big challenge. You know, we've, we're 18 months or so from a general election. You tell me, any of you, if you can think of a politician on the front bench of either side who you could actually go through their budget, um, could sit in a cabinet or shadow cabinet meeting and talk about relative sums of money and how it could be allocated, and um, not being rude about my colleagues, because they've got many challenges that they're dealing with day to day, whether ministers or shadow ministers, but I bet that that's conversation is not happening, and it needs to be at a more political level. Um, and I think, you know, hats off to Chief Secretaries of the Treasury and, and, and Chancellors and Shadow Chancellors and Shadow Chief Secretaries who are trying to get that debate into their cabinets, cabinet meetings, but I think there's a big problem there about how that's done. And, Curiously, at local government level, it's probably better, probably because people are a bit closer to the ground um, um, and seeing this will happen in this ward or this will happen in our schools. And it just feels big, big, big amounts of money just feel very distant, I think. And I don't know how we get over that. And better financial education for ministers. When I was a councillor, I had training about how to understand accounts because I said, I don't really understand this local government finance stuff. Help me, please. And we don't do enough of that for members in the parliament. <coughs> Great. And to, on uh, Roger's question, first of all, from British Red Cross, um, the, uh, absolutely the, the uh, impact on different vulnerable groups uh, is something which, as Meg said, we can understand better and better today using data. It was a key issue, obviously, in COVID. Um, I know it's one of the first issues which is going to be looked at by the COVID inquiry. Um, uh, but even in the, um, the kind of, in, in the conduct of that, I saw examples of how, for example, um, uh, you know, we were uh, 
uh, saw very quickly that it had different impacts on different uh, uh, ethnic groups, which required both a medical response. We also saw, for example, I remember the, the take up of vaccines in different communities was very different. Um, that's not so much a medical response, it's more like a kind of behavioral response. And we actually, uh, the government hired influencers in different communities to try and you know, encourage that take up, and that was quite successful. So I think you know, be, being very quickly responsive to differential impacts across different groups is something which is key to modern government, and uh, you're absolutely right to, to highlight that. And on David's question, I've got no, no, no sort of magic solution to it, but um, I think, um, uh, first of all, the reality uh, uh, you, know, you, you, you would recognize as well as it's more tr trilateral than bilateral. I think between sort of number 10 and cabinet office and deputy prime minister and the role that you had, um, as CDL as well, working um, as a sort of counterpoint with the treasury and the, the line department. But the big areas of kind of opportunity, I feel, are in cross-government budgets when you think about you know, net zero and economic security yeah. and leveling up. They're not just one department, there's lots yeah. of different departments. So I think that is the area of space we need to be better at. And we've tried different things with sort of budget holders across government, but I think that the, uh, the ministerial process there could, could certainly be strengthened. Um, the other thing is just, which relates to what I was saying before about recycling from low value projects, is that you know, oftentimes the political pressures are so great that you want to kind of fully allocate all your money and then you know, everyone, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of gone. The reality, as we must all recognize in recent years, is that you need to hold a lot back, back for future contingencies and you need to be very disciplined about that. And also, when you may have given it to somebody, it turns out that the, the benefits, the impact of what they thought they'd be able to get are just yeah, not coming. Exactly. And then you just say, well, you can't have it anymore. Bad luck. Yeah. Because we need that for something else. And yes. I think those, those are the two areas of really, I would really focus attention. Thank you. Okay, there's a question online from Gerard Adams. How can we ensure that crisis planning stretches beyond the constraints of the five-year political cycle in Westminster? More questions. There's a question, yep. uh, Lauren, down here at the front. Thanks, uh, Toby Harris, House of Lords, and I chair the National Preparedness Commission. I'd be interested to expand on this point about um, short-termism in government. How do you institutionalize long-term thinking? How do you actually make it happen? And then more specifically, who owns systemic risk and interconnected risk? You've got your risk owners and risk managers in the different government departments, but risks are necessarily interconnected. And mm -hmm. Meg gave the example of what happens when the schools close. That clearly wasn't contemplated. So who is responsible for thinking across departmental boundaries? And there's one just Great. gentleman here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Hugh Lloyd, previously uh, an advisor at CLGN DEFRA. Um, I wonder, Meg, if you could examine, you, you're starting to make the point about the relationship between the civil services, one bit of the governance system, mm -hmm. and local officials, be they in local government or other frontline public service delivery. Um, what could we improve about the relationship between those things, given many crises? Mm -hmm perhaps are already starting in some places, they're just not necessarily national. So, you know, we might get ahead if we had good relations. What could we do on that front? Thank you. Okay. Alex, do you want to start? Um, great. I'll, I'll just say a couple of things on each one and then I'll hand over to Meg for, for better answers. You've got more time to prepare. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, <coughs> on the, um, uh, the, the, the first question um, around the planning, um, uh, so it's so more than five years. Um, uh, uh, of the political cycle, I think a couple of things. First of all, the um, the, it, it, the the national uh, security risk assessment, the national risk assessment, is indeed much longer than that, much longer horizons, 10, 15, 20 years. There are longer risks than that, and the process of preparing that, compiling it, has just been completely overhauled and done with uh, um, the help of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and it's now um, I think very strong. We just published the the NSRA has been completed, and the NRA, the new one, will be published very shortly. So. See for yourself, but I think that is a, is a good, really solid way of thinking about very hard about long-term risks and issues. Um, the other thing is just um, to mention is that, um, <clears throat> and uh, paying a compliment here to the IFG, in your report last July on managing extreme risks, you said, look, it's difficult for the people who are dealing with the day-to-day -day crisis in what we call the COBRA team to really give enough time and attention to things that are five or 10 years away. Um, when that's the same thing. So the old civil contingency secretariat was all in the same group. We've now separated that, and a completely separate team are responsible for that long-term, they call the Resilience Directorate, 
so they're not caught up in the day-to-day -day pressures, so to enable that time to think ahead. So I think that is a genuine improvement, and thank you for your report suggesting it. Um, on Toby's questions about kind of um, interactions between different risks, so one of the things there that we've become obviously hugely conscious, even more conscious uh, of through the financial crisis, Brexit, and COVID is that um, you, know, you prepare for, for one risk you know, and a second risk, but you have these sort of multiple effects and it ripples right through the whole system. And you know, the economic consequences of you know, lockdown, for example, would be a good example of it. So I think that um, some of the testing that we did wasn't as thorough and as complete as it could be. And the new, t the new exercises we do are very, very real and very much look at multiple different scenarios and secondary and tertiary and um, quadruple effects. Um, we've just done one, for example, on um, what would happen in case of a major energy outage. It's called Mighty Oak, but it is exactly testing that um, integrated systemic effects. Um, and then the uh, question about um, <coughs> interactions between cent central and local government. Um, I think that um, I was very struck by a report written by, dare I say, another institute, the uh, Blavatnik. I was going to highlight um, that, yes. Who've just written a fantastic report themselves about um, long-term um, crises. And they talk there about the interactions between central and local, both recognizing that they got a bit better during Brexit, but also, I think, making a very fair and powerful point that so much is now expected of the local channel. Have they really got the capacity to deliver on that, yeah. especially not for just a short-term crisis like a flood or something like that. Local resilience forums are well set up for that. But when you have to do it for month after month, year after year, have they really got the capability to deliver against that? And their view is that they weren't really set up for some of the jobs that, that COVID would have, uh, would have asked them to play. And uh, I think that is a very serious point to be taken. Yeah, I can recommend that report. Like, yeah, on the five-year planning cycle, I mean, there, there, is, there are many things in government that go beyond that. The MOD equipment plan, which is over 10 years. Mm. Um, and so that, that's interesting. Thing. I always think on defence, whatever the politics have been, and been quite diverse across the last 13 years or so, there's actually a fairly standard approach to that. So that mm -hmm. helps because there's some consensus. Yeah, we can argue about which type of tank or whatever, but broadly speaking, both main parties anyway are... are broadly in the same place. But I do think that, that this is partly just the inevitability of democracy, that you're going to get, you know, a new government comes in. In fact, sometimes individuals in an existing government will change, mm. and that can change. Look at the, the issue of the difference between Chris Grayling and Michael Gove at Ministry of Justice, for instance. So we saw quite radical change, even with individuals. I mean, I think that individual change worries me a bit more than, than, than the five-year change, because if you, you've got to have some certainty. What I think is something that politicians should bear in mind is if you chop and change, it, this is very difficult for the civil service. They need decisions to keep moving on. They need to know that they've got backup political cover for those decisions to be implemented. So when things get rocky or difficult, mm -hmm. or there's criticism, that they've got that political cover to deliver, or a political judgment that we just need to cut our losses at this point, but the cover is there. Otherwise, you just end up with inertia, and I think there is a real problem. Um, so I think we, we're sort of in, saddled with the five-year planning cycle. I mean, the challenge, of course, having had the five-year election term, which was quite nice for those of us knowing when our jobs might end, or or, or whatever we've done for election. Um, actually, now we're all on tenterhooks because we could have an election any moment now. And so we're in that awful ga gap between elections where things are not, you know, not somewhat. I think the government would think things are happening, but it, 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 there is a certain inertia there as well. And Toby, I think on, on um, the short term and long term, this is one of the things we want to see a risk officer for, mm. to see that overall picture of what's going on and actually across the public sector, really. I mean, they, wouldn't, they would obviously be government-focused um, because that embedding that long-termism, I think, as Alex sort of has hinted at, if you've got long-term funded projects that it's quite difficult for a politician to unpick it, you could say it's a crafty civil service plot to keep certain things sensible going. But actually, because it, but, it, but we do need some consensus on some of those long-term things like the digital change we've been talking about, or it doesn't, don't you know, but I think who owns the systemic risk? You've got to have someone very senior who can walk in, just like you've got a national security advisor can walk into the prime minister and say, prime minister, this is the situation. You know, you, you've got to understand this. You need someone who can be, who's got real clout. And I think the danger of what Alex is, you know, talks about accounting officers and everything, having quite rightly their assessment and understanding of risk in their own area. Mm. I do think you need that overarching thing, and that's the position of the committee. And on the terms of about the, uh, working with the civil service, working with lo locally, I think in COVID we saw a little bit more understanding uh, about it. But actually, what I find still too often is you get in front of us as well in committee um, senior civil servants, not all um, secretaries by any means, but 
who don't talk to people on the ground. So uh, one, one recently we had a civil servant talking about a situation that had happened in a local authority and they talked about it as though it was exceptional. And we were a bunch of MPs and we're going, hang on a minute, you know, mm. in all our areas, this is the same thing is going on. You cannot say this is a one-off exception. And I think that moving, well, let's, I, I, I hesitate to say the government has moved the civil service out of London, because let's face it, that's been happening for many years. Mm -hmm. The Labour government did that too. But what we're now seeing is some very senior civil servants. We were just counting up, weren't we? Two second perm secretaries are now based outside London, HMRC and Treasury with uh, Beth in, um, up in Darlington. Mm. But we need to see much more of that so that they think it's a normal thing. It would be quite normal to go and engage with the local authority. And I meet regularly with certain local authority groups and it's really helpful to hear their take on how government policy is working. So if you're talking to treasurers of councils or whatever, and they, they, I think government could do with hearing that much more directly. And there was a yeah. danger that Whitehall doesn't want to contaminate its advice giving to, yeah. to government. And I think we need to see, so as a minister, I remember once well, a number of times sitting in meetings and you'd get someone from a trade union or a local government or coming to talk to you. And their points were very reasonable. We were at that point in the Labour government where we didn't, announce something till it was ready to announce. And then you announced it, and then you got feedback. It was the wrong way round. Um, I'm not sure any government's got it perfect, but actually much better to be open about ideas, fly some kites, hear people's views and shape it. And I think the civil service is still a bit in the policy side of things. Although Tamara Finkelstein is now leading the policy um, profession, which is um, a, sort of a shift, isn't it? So we might see some change, but I think they're a bit more in their own little eerie and don't always hear those outside voices and good local officials on the ground in local government are very directly connected to their population. And as my, my acting chief executive in Hackney said, I was complaining about potholes to him, you know, we all have our things we complain about when I'm cycling around Hackney. And, and he said, oh, I was running in the half marathon and I had a good close look at all the potholes. <laughs> and that's a big difference to what Alex is doing every day. Yeah, Alex, the last um, final word. I, I really agree with that. And actually, when we talk about our Places for Growth programme and stuff, sometimes it can seem a bit like, is it about just moving people around for the sake of it or about cheaper offices? It's not, it really isn't about mm. that. It is about the reality of getting close to communities mm. that we serve. And, just as, a, a, you know, as a little illustration of that, I, when I was up in, in Darlington last a month, and I've just written, by the way, a fantastic uh, IFG report coming out this week on Darlington, which I've just started to read. Um, uh, but when I was there last month, actually, there was the, um, there's eight different departments, if you, if you haven't been there before, um, working together in this, this one big office, and, it, and mostly people who've, who've joined recently, and terrific uh, energy and, and vitality to it. But, the Treasury kind of labour markets team were actually there in the building the day that I was there, and I saw them having a, having a seminar, a workshop jointly with people who worked in the local benefits office about, you know, who, who were responsible for helping people back into work, um, you know, and uh, job coaches. And you thought, well, that's a very different type of policy making type of thing. Obviously, the sort of fearsomely clever analytical people with facts and figures coming out mm. of things trained up to the gills, but actually listening yeah. to the experience of people at the front line of trying to get people back into the job. And I thought that was, that, that was a kind of like, aha, this is beginning to work type yeah. moment. It was great. Yeah. yeah, that's a nice positive uh, thought to end on. And I can recommend our report on Darlington, which is indeed out this week. Um, thanks for that. So can I just uh, ask you to thank our uh, speakers for joining us today? Uh, I think it's been a great event. <laughs> And should you wish to watch back, catch any remarks that you missed, or, uh, or recommend it to your friends, there will be a video and sound recording on our website and on YouTube shortly. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs>